Okay, greetings and welcome to uh, msdynamicsworld.com's document management webcast series. I'm Jason Gumpert, and we are lucky to be joined today by our returning speaker, uh, Jim Just of iMerge Consulting. Uh, Jim is an expert in workflow, uh, including business process management, as well as records management, enterprise content management technologies and best practices. And, uh, and today's session is all about uh, the business processes, um, hopefully the ones that matter to you in the world of Microsoft Dynamic Solutions. So we invite you to uh, to add your feedback and ask questions today as we get started. Uh, we do want to keep the session interactive, and uh, you can use the chat and the Q&A block that you see to the right of the screen uh, to do just that. So uh, without uh, further delay, please allow me to welcome uh, Jim Just. Thank you very much, Jason. Appreciate the intro. Uh, just a little more on Emerge. Emerge is a... Uh, uh, a, a completely vendor neutral unbiased consultancy. Uh, we are throughout uh, North America. Uh, we work out of uh, offices around the country and we have an office in Toronto as well. And we do, as, as uh, Jason mentioned, we are in all aspects of unstructured information management, document management, uh, business process management, business process redesign, records management, information governance, uh, we develop everything from records management policies to classification schemes and business process, uh, uh, current and future state designs, et cetera. So uh, probably our, uh, the main thing is we are vendor neutral and unbiased. We don't sell any products um, and we don't do programming. So we're the guys that tell you what to do, not, uh, not do it, kind of like the IBM ad. So, what I want to talk about today, um, let me go into the uh, agenda here. We're going to talk about uh, identifying process improvement opportunities. So how do you kind of figure out where the problems are? Uh, and I would guess that most of your organizations are pretty good at telling you where they have problems, but we'll, we'll point out a couple of things you can look for. Uh, we're going to talk about when to use process automation software, uh, so when do you use workflow software, business process management software. Uh, we're going to talk about organizational considerations uh, for measuring and improving processes. So if you're going to be rolling out uh, a big process change with or without automation, and most of what I'm talking to you today is about uh, process improvement in general, but um, tech, typically that includes some level of technology implementation, uh, but we'll be talking about that as well, and then some tips for process improvement and rollout. And I want to uh, emphasize what Jason said, if, if you have questions, if there's something you want me to delve into deeper, uh, if there's a specific process or area you want to talk about, please uh, throw it into the Q&A and Jason will be monitoring that. All right. So identifying process improvement opportunities. One of the first places to look, of course, is where you have a lot of paper. Um, and I do want to just mention, I'm getting over a cold, so if I, uh, if I have to stop for a second, I will. Um, and uh, if you look for paper problems in the organization, look for stacks of paper, that's typically an indication that you have a paper-driven process, and that paper-driven process is ripe for, for improvement. And you can look at... Um, at that in a number of different ways, uh, typically organizations with high volumes of document movement like uh, loan documents in a bank or insurance uh, claims, they will already have addressed, you know, pretty significant process improvements, but it doesn't mean that you can't um, do more. So it's always worth uh, watching those processes and seeing where the opportunities are uh, based on heavy volume of paper activity. And the desk in the bottom middle picture is actually a real live guy's desk. So there's, there can be problems everywhere. Another one, it's one of my favorites, is you talk to the folks that talk to the people in your uh, outside of your company. You uh, look for, uh, you talk to the customer service representatives, the folks on the help desk, the uh, accounts payable and accounting people that are talking to outside vendors and partners. And you find out from them what problems they have. You know what <clears throat> what what do people not like about doing business with you? Um, you know what frustrates them? 
And that usually is a pretty good idea, give, give you a pretty good idea of a process that might need some fixing. So uh, talk to folks. That's probably your, the easiest way to find out opportunities for improvement. Another is to look for uh, forms. Um, I know every organization has lots of forms, and those forms can be online. They can be, uh, you know, things like Adobe Acrobat forms. They can be fill-in-print forms. They can be, you know, paper forms that are filled out. Uh, one of the really common process improvement opportunities we see, surprisingly enough, is still forms that are filled out online or filled out in a Adobe form or Word form and then printed so that they can be signed. Um, so there's usually a, a print, a sign, a submission. If it's an outside person, it's a submission through, you know, fax or through email. Um, and then it goes through some kind of an approval process for sign off internally. Um, those are terrific opportunities for low hanging fruit and for process improvement uh, by converting those to electronic forms, routing them, and getting electronic approvals. So really, uh, really like to look for those opportunities when we're working with our clients and usually find a whole bunch of them. Um, even with, you know, enterprise systems, uh, having automated a lot of the, a lot of that work, um, there's still a lot of it out there. So definitely something to keep an eye out for. Uh, next. Uh, one of the ways to look for is a little digging a little bit deeper, um, looking for process improvement opportunities, is to compare the kinds of things that you do to, to industry benchmarks, to industry scorecards, uh, key performance indicators, that kind of thing. So if you pull that kind of data from them, there's millions of databases out there, and um, every industry has theirs, um, and then compare how you're doing to those folks. Uh, you're, you know cost per transaction kinds of things can be real indicators of where there's opportunities for process improvement. Um, obviously, as we kind of along the same lines of talking to your customer service folks at the survey, the user community in general, uh, where are they frustrated? Where do they have issues? Where are they wasting time? Um, and that's a, an opportunity for process improvement. <clears throat> and another big one is to look at the strategic plan. Uh, you know, where are you going? Um, if there's going to be an improvement, a, a, an increase in, in sales in a partic particular market, what ramifications will that have through the, uh, the rest of your processes? You know, can you handle it? Have they staffed appropriately? Um, you know, it's kind of that vision thing. Where are you going and do you have the resources necessary to make that happen? And those could be technology resources, they could be um, people resources. And it's just a really good idea to keep your keep your uh, your eyes on that. All right. So, if there's any uh, additional thoughts or questions on that, on kind of how to identify uh, process improvement opportunities, um, shoot a question in there, and we'll uh, we'll try to address it. So, when do you use process automation software? And in our last, the last webinar I did, we talked a little bit about the difference between um, using workflow in a Dynamics kind of pro product or a, you know, any kind of enterprise uh, resource planning system, uh, any kind of business system really, um, and as opposed to using, uh, for instance, workflow automation software in SharePoint or in a document management system. And just briefly, when you're focused on workflow for a transaction that's within that business system, that's usually you know a no-brainer. You're going to try to automate it within that system. Sometimes licensing issues get in the way. You've got a process that crosses the entire organization, uh, but only 25% of the organization have access to the business system that owns that process. So in that situation, you may need to externalize that, pro that, uh, that process from the business system and use something like a document management workflow solution uh, or a SharePoint workforce <coughs> workflow solution for that matter. So if it's document-centric, we tend to see that the business systems don't handle document-centric 
processes very well. Um, they tend to be better handled within a document management workflow solution so that everything's seamless. And again, I include SharePoint in that discussion. Um, <clears throat> So, um, again, we talked about that in the last presentation, so I don't want to go into too much detail, but there are definitely um, kind of some parameters you can, you can go on for uh, whether you use the business system or not. Um, but some of the things to look at for process automation software is volume, number one. Obviously, the higher the volume, the more opportunity for automation. Uh, cross-functional, if you have processes that cross departments, if they're enterprise-wide, um, obviously it's harder to keep track of that kind of a process if it's not in a, in a business system. So um, you are better off, in that case, you know, automating it with workflow and being able to track the activities of that, of that process throughout the entire organization. Um, Time-sensitive processes, if you have a process that requires that it be done within X amount of time or you have penalties or you have upset customers or it's simply a strategic goal of the organization, automating those processes gives you the control so that you can monitor in real time and, and escalate processes if they're running behind. Um, that's really a very, very common place that we see the application workflow technology. Uh, risk mitigation, along the same lines, if you have a process that, again, if it isn't done in a timely manner, there's risk, or if you need to show and prove that you did the process the way it was supposed to be done, um, you know, something where you have to prove to a government entity or a, uh, uh, a governing entity of some sort, then, again, Everything's in a database with workflow, so you can track um, every single thing that's happened with the process and know exactly who touched it, when, and what was done, and <clears throat> approvals that were made along that line. So uh, risk mitigation can be a, a terrific um, uh, benefit, terrific, and a great way from, from workflow. Uh, cost identification and reduction. Uh, when you need to identify what costs are in a process and you don't have a good handle on it, when you automate it, you start to develop metrics, which is the, the next point. So as you automate, you're also gathering data, and that data can be fed back through the loop and help identify where you have high-cost um, areas or uh, other kind of problems in the process that you want to address. Um, and then simulation, again, I mentioned earlier, if you're going to, if your strategic plan is to grow an area of business and you want to make sure that the process can sustain that in, increase in business, once you've automated the process um, and you have that design, you can then simulate, well, what would happen if we threw another 30% or 40% or we bought a company and we threw another, you know, 100% of work against that process, where is it going to break? So it can identify your bottlenecks and, again, help you improve the process before it breaks. Um, Jim, we, there is a question that came in. Okay, um, yeah. Or I guess it's more of a topic. Uh, and it's not something I'm familiar with, but it's um, CA, CAL versus SAL or, or SAL models. Is that something? Uh, I'm not sure what they're asking there, to be honest with you. Okay, well, I, I'd invite the, the person who asked that to maybe provide a little more background for us, uh, licensing, oh, software licensing. Licensing, okay. okay. Um, I was I thought that's what you meant, but I wasn't quite sure. Um, if you mean uh, licensing from the standpoint of uh, business system or workflow, because I mentioned um, depending on how you, your software is licensed, um, sometimes you don't have, you know, people that, need access to the software that's running the process, don't have access, or they aren't trained, or it's too complicated to use that system. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why you might want to externalize a business process from the business system into an external uh, work process management system. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, uh, bottlenecks in terms of licenses. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I guess that, that just gets to the heart of uh, do you have the licenses for a enterprise-wide process in the business system that owns the the uh, the process itself? Um, there was another question that just came in. Um, let me just read it here. Uh, what is your approach regarding business case calculation for process improvement? Uh, it's hard to calculate benefits from process automation, uh, licensing, et cetera. Um, yeah, every business case analysis is different. Uh, if you can use a uh, process modeling software that can do simulation, it can be easier to and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a little bit. It can be easier to identify those those cost savings, um, and it depends on how your organization calculates uh, cost savings. If you're, you know, if a cost benefit analysis in your organization doesn't take into consideration a time saving that doesn't doesn't replace a, a person, then you know some of your cost savings are going to be out the window. Uh, some organizations will accept that you're going to save everybody, you know, 100 people an hour a day, so you're saving 100 hours, but other people say, well, if you aren't replacing two and a half people, then I'm not going to count that as a saving. So um, that really depends a lot on exactly how big the process is and what the business case is and what you have to answer. Um, but the more you use workflow software or modeling software that can simulate uh, a future state, it's Jimmy you still there? Looks like we lost Jim's line there. Um, why don't we pause for a second and see if he uh, jumps back on? I don't know what happened. My uh, line just dropped, and I'm not uh, even voice over IP, so I'm not quite sure what happened there. Um, no problem. Yep. So, yeah, so hopefully that answered the question. Um, it's a hard one. It, it, we could spend quite a bit of time on, on calculating business case costs, and I'll touch a little bit on that later. But um, so I, I hopefully you heard the, the full answer on that one. Um, so the other the other point I wanted to make here was uh, for using process automation was encapsulating work rules. That's a kind of a big thing right now, actually, and it's one of the reasons we're seeing uh, a lot of activity on on advancing uh, the use of uh, business process management and workflow software. Um, and that's the baby boomer retirement um, bubble that's coming up. Got a lot of knowledge walking out of organizations, and a lot of new folks that are going to be coming in and having having to be trained up on on the work that those folks were doing. And to the extent that they can be that um, knowledge can be encapsulated into a business process and into work rules, um, you know, there's advantage in doing that. And it may be that those folks don't have to be you know replaced one for one. You can make the process a lot more efficient you might be able to do without as many people. So um, I know a lot of my clients are talking in the next five to seven years, anywhere from 30 to, to 50 percent of their um, their folks are going to be retiring. So it can be a huge, huge impact. So if you have high volume or high turnover work activities, then it makes more sense to encapsulate those in business processes. Uh, capture the business rules, uh, make those decision points automated so that the training is simpler and quicker. And obviously you also get a great deal of consistency because it's everything's being driven by a database. So um, another one then is uh, state change. One of the things we see a lot is the uh, when you have processes that are um, sensitive to folks outside or even inside the organization. For example, you put in an application, you want to know the status of the application. So the customer service people are getting calls, you know, what's the status of my application? What's the status of my loan? What's the status of my whatever, uh, you know, my problem um, and resolution? Uh, if you automate the process and you build into that process state change notifications, then as the state changes, as it moves from person to person, as the approval is made, you push out those state change notices to the people that are involved. 
So they know proactively that the state has changed. You need, they don't have to make a phone call, send an email, or, or otherwise bother you. So it can collapse some of that uh, time that's spent uh, throughout an organization on a process. So that's a real good, real good use of, of technology, and any of the workflow systems out there pretty much can do anything from sending an email to sending a text message, et cetera. Um, and then visibility into the process. Uh, along the same lines uh, as the state change, if you want to know metrics, if you want to see what's going on in real time, if you want to know, you know how things are flowing through the organization, you get those kinds of metrics out of a dashboard. So you can see <clears throat> how many items am I processing, how many people are involved in it, and that kind of thing. So again, if it's in a database, um, it's uh, uh, going to be um, available to you for metrics, and that can tie into, again, you know, a SharePoint kind of portal and that type of thing. All right. So some different, just thought I'd throw this in there for you. There's a whole bunch of different business process management um, and workflow software uh, products out there. Sorry, there's a typo in that heading. Um, if you're in the Microsoft ecosystem with Dynamics, SharePoint, those kinds of products, they both leverage Windows Workflow Foundations. Um, so you can obviously develop directly in, in Workflow Foundations if you have that expertise. Um, there's also, <clears throat> excuse me, there's also a product called Nintex that, that has a, a five or six hundred activities that leverage Windows Workflow Foundations, lives within the SharePoint ecosystem, and makes use of, of all of all of that um, workflow technology that's built into the Windows Foundations. Um, it's not a separate system, it's just additional activities built on top of the workflow foundations. Uh, the rest of these, K2, Workflow, Gen, Skelta, they all leverage the uh, workflow foundations, but they also have their own outside of, of the workflow foundation software and, and servers and processes and that kind of thing. Um, they're all different options out there. I'm not recommending anything. They're just that you might uh, like to see some things that we run across all the time. And then obviously there's lots of uh, web parts out there uh, that, that can be applied to specific problems. Um, you know, massive volume of those out on the web. So, and then for general purpose business process management systems and workflow systems, there's a whole ton of those out there. And um, from anybody from IBM FileNet down to, you know, small, even Skelt is also a, a general purpose outside of, uh, of the SharePoint ecosystem. So um, got another question here. Uh, do you recommend any third party BVM solutions for Dynamics CRM? We don't recommend solutions because um, we are vendor neutral and unbiased. So I can't specifically recommend one. I, I think the best thing is to reach out to the Dynamics community and ask folks what they're what they're using uh, and what, what will work you know, best with Dynamics. I will say that almost any decent BPM system has the hooks to tie into any database and and, um, and leverage the data that's there. Uh, it, there's, um, you know, almost every system today is web service driven. Uh, they'll have URL uh, APIs as well as, you know, and then also have the usual J2 and .NET kind of of APIs. So if there's a, you know, a BPM system in-house that you could use, um, you can probably leverage it, but um, I can't say specifically what, what the best CRM uh, BPM system is for, for CRM, dynamic CRM. All right, thank you for the questions, really appreciate that. Um, organizational considerations, so let's talk a little bit about deployment and kind of the analysis process that you would go through for a uh, business process improvement exercise. Um, <clears throat> these five uh, activities are, are really what should be followed no matter what you're doing. If it's a small, 
you know, I, I got some forms I'm automating or I've got a process I'm automating a little bit um, or, a, or an enterprise-wide major, major re-engineering project, you really want to follow all five of these steps so that it goes smoothly. Um, if you don't, if you try to shortcut, inevitably it's going to come back to bite you. So I really recommend, and I'm going to talk about each of these, but it's scope, you know, scoping the project correctly. And any, you know, any of you out there that are project managers, this won't sound, uh, this will sound pretty familiar. Uh, you've got to model the current state. What are you doing today? So, you know, get buy-in, implement the future state, and then continuous process improvement over time. But the key here is it's 80% analysis and 20% implementation. And I, you know, can't stress that enough. Um, anytime I, my clients try to shortcut the analysis and get right into development, inevitably it takes more time than if they had just done it all, you know, done the analysis work up front. So from a scope standpoint, um, first and foremost, you have, you have to just, you have to set the ground rules for the redesign effort. You know, who's going to make decisions, who sets the parameters, uh, who's, who decides the redesign limits, how far are you going to take this? You know, if it's an enterprise-wide process, are you going to do, you know, two or three departments first, one department first, then grow it? Who's going to make those decisions? It's real important to know how that's going to happen. And then who determines resource allocation? Um, who's the go-to person that says, yeah, we can, we can hire staff, we can move staff, we can bring in some business analyst resources, et cetera, you know, all the things that you need to make it happen. The other thing would be you have to kind of understand that anytime you're doing a redesign project like uh, of any kind, you're introducing change. And change can be good and change can be kind of scary. So. If you're redoing, and obviously the bigger the, the process redesign effort, the more some of these things will impact you. But if you've got a team and you're doing a re-engineering effort and you're, let's say you're working on an order process and you find out that you could change the model and it would impact salespeople's commissions, you know, do you have the right to do that? Can you, can you go that far? Uh, what if you want to move the work to home-based workers? Is, you know, can you do that? Uh, what if you could outsource the whole function? Can you do that? Uh, what if you're going to eliminate 20 jobs, including your boss? You know, uh, are they going to let you do that? So, um, you know, it can get pretty uh, pretty crazy, and the and the folks doing this the business process improvement uh, have to know what the limits are uh, for that team. That makes sense. I hope. All right. A sip of water. So from a sponsor standpoint, uh, from a scoping standpoint, rather, um, you have to identify your sponsor. Usually that's the, uh, the business manager that you're working with um, on the process. If it's, again, departmental versus enterprise, it's easier. If it's enterprise, it's more important to have an executive sponsor at the C-level that is over all the areas that are involved in that process. Um, otherwise, you run into, you know, territorial fights and that kind of thing, and well, why are you, you know, taking my people's time and, and whatever? So <clears throat> the more it's driven by the strategic plan and meets the strategic plan, the easier this is, of course. But um, you got to have the right sponsorship or you're almost inevitably going to run into problems. Again, if, if it's a one department, I'm fixing some things for, for that area, that's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the sponsor, executive sponsor, and line manager could all be the same person. Uh, you need your business analyst involved, and you need your subject matter experts. Uh, and I have subject matter experts in parens because from a scoping standpoint, you may or may not have them involved. It may be more of a management decision. But uh, I'm, I'm real big on inclusion, and I like to see the SMEs involved at every stage of the game. So you have to define and agree on the scope and adjust the project as it progresses because, you know, inevitably you're going to run into things that pop up that you need to, to deal with. So then, again, you need to model the current state, and that involves, uh, again, management, line managers, subject matter experts, and business analysts. So you need to know what you're doing today before you try to fix it, because if you try to fix something that you don't fully understand, you will inevitably miss something and create a mess. So it's really critical that you spend the time modeling the current state. 
Um, when you're doing that, you ask the question, why, a lot. Um, I like to tell my clients when I'm doing this, I said, I'm going to sound like a three-year-old, um, asking why all the time. Um, but that's the way it, it goes. You know, why do you do it? Well, we do it because I was told to do it when I was hired on 10 years ago. So that's the way we do it. And inevitably, you'll find things that just don't make sense to you, um, especially if you're an outsider looking at a process in, in a different area. Um, that's why Six Sigma, you know, process improvement, you always involve people from outside of the area that's being analyzed. Um, so ask why a lot. Gather metrics. Uh, what's the volume of activity times the time unit takes to do it? This kind of gets back to that question of cost-benefit that came up earlier. What's the wait time? How long is work sitting on a desk waiting to be worked on? Uh, some organizations consider that to be a very high cost item. Uh, the status of the work unit, you know, how, when do I need to know that the status has changed as I go through the process? Uh, the penalties and risk, what happens if we don't get the process done on time? You know, what, what's the penalty for that? What's the risk to, um, you know, the company, the group, the manager, if things aren't done in a timely manner. And then the value of the strategic objectives. Um, again, if you're trying, if you're re-engineering something, <clears throat> redesigning a process to meet strategic objectives, you want to make sure that you value that, that uh, strategic objective so your cost benefit is appropriately um, uh, leverages that, that value. Okay. Uh, again, state changes and notifications. Where in the process do we need to let people know that the state has changed or um, uh, there's an issue? Uh, business rules. You've got to gather all the business rules that, that are in place. Uh, you know, if I have a, a process that if it's over $10,000, it goes one way. If it's other $10,000 and under, it goes a different way. I have to know that. And then business system interaction. Are you pulling data, pushing data? What screens do they use? Um, are, is there a lot of uh, uh, multiple data entry steps going on? Is there too many screens going, going through in the process that's taking too much time? You want to understand that as well, because if in the process automation, you'd want to try to address it. Um, and the, I think the key takeaway is that you want to think enterprise. Um, Way too often processes are built to meet a departmental need and there's no recognition that folks outside of that department or even outside of the enterprise um, need access to or information about or from the process. So even if you think you're working in a department as a departmental process, you want to make darn sure that you understand the enterprise view of things and that you're providing, you know, all the downstream users access to the information or access to the process that need access and take into consideration <clears throat> the upstream contributors. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. I apologize for the throat clearing. So if you don't have modeling software, um, there's a lot of modeling software out there. Visio, obviously, probably everybody has Visio. Whether you use it or not is another question. Uh, mind, map, so mind mapping software, there's a three or four of those out there. Smart draws one, Create Lee's another uh, Visio-like product. Um, there's a few open source solutions. I've seen people do amazing process modeling in PowerPoint and Word, Excel. Um, sometimes you just do a textual uh, current state. Um, there's nothing wrong with that either, especially for simpler. I will say that the more complex a um, a, a process, the more important it is to graphically model it. It just makes it a lot easier for people who are, you know, evaluating the process and making decisions on, on the future state to, uh, to do that work. Um, so there's a lot of information out there about how to do process modeling. That, that's a whole different, you know, world. We won't get into that today. I imagine most of you are business analysts that do that work with you or for you uh, anyway. So, so modeling the future state, you want to make sure that you gather the desired metrics. So you know what you're doing today, but what are you going to be, you know, what do you want to do in the future? Um, 
Yeah, uh, somebody just asked if the slides are available. Absolutely, we'll make those available to you um, after the session. I'll, I'll send them to Jason for uh, to be sent out to you all. Thank you for that. I meant to mention that at the beginning. And somebody liked the uh, enterprise image. Thank you. I like that too. Um, so uh, desired metrics versus current state. So where do you want to be? You know, what's this model? What are you trying to? What's the goal of the model? Where are you trying to to be? Are you trying to you know, reduce staff time? Are you trying to move a process along faster? Um, I had one the other day that was taking four days. They wanted to get it down to, you know, three or four hours. Um, is the future state going to change staffing? Uh, you know, are you moving people around? Are they changing departments? Are you moving work to the front end of the process and less work at the back end of the process because of automation? Uh, are you going to get impacted by union rules? Um, Business system impact. Are you changing screens? Are you going to have, you know, are you going to merge five screens into one so that you get faster data entry or faster retrieval? Um, any good workflow system can push and pull data to business systems if you wanted to. So um, I have seen people take a workflow screen and pull data from three different systems, present it to a a, a uh, end user for an action, and then they make their decisions, and that data gets pushed back um, rather than going to the business system itself. So a lot of things that you can do with technology, um, but regardless of technology, you may have business system impacts. Um, resources uh, that are needed to implement. Um, any process change is going to require staffing to work through it, right? business analysts and, and technologists and whatnot. So again, got to make sure that those are accounted for. And anything else that's required by the project at hand, and that's going to vary based on the kind of project you, that you're doing. Okay. Uh, buy-in, obviously, if you don't have buy-in, you're not going to get very far. So once you've got your future state modeled out, the same people that have been involved all along, this shouldn't be very hard. Um, if you've been engaged with the managers and the C-level manager, if necessary, the line manager and the subject matter experts, you should be able to get buy-in pretty easy. You should pretty much be there at the end of the future state model. Um, I like to have involvement of <clears throat> as many people when you get down to the, you know, beyond the initial stages of defining what the future state will look like and, and defining the current state for that matter. <clears throat> I'd like to go beyond SMEs and get as many of the, uh, the line worker people involved as possible because sometimes they, you know, they do things and they know things that just gets, get overlooked. And you want to catch those sooner rather than later. Okay. Looking to see if we have any more questions, and we don't, so I'll roll right along. Uh, model and implement future state. So some design considerations. Um, this is my law. Process improvement success is inversely proportional to the length of time of deployment. Whether it's a physical, um, you know, just a redesign of a process, or you're applying workflow business process management technology, or another major technology initiative, um, the longer it takes, the less likely you are to succeed. Things change, rules change, you know, people move your cheese, and you're back to, you know, you, you all of a sudden you're back to uh, ground zero. So a big part of my rollout tips, and this kind of merges into the last part of the agenda, which is the rollout tips, because they kind of are one and the same. Um, make sure you do phased approaches. What can be implemented successfully in a reasonable time frame? Um, make sure that you've scoped this, even if the big scope is, um, your big scope is greater than what you're implementing in phase one, uh, make sure your phase one is doable in a fairly um, short time frame. And my kind of cutoff for any kind of redesign process is six months. Um, anything beyond that, you're going to inevitably do a lot of rework. So I prefer to try to see this get done in two to three months for a reasonably um, scoped uh, kind of phase. And that assumes things like it's not the first implementation of a workflow product, for example. Obviously, that's a different different story. But um, 
in a typical approach, you want to try to keep it as short and reasonable as possible. Um, keep the business rules simple. People know their job. You don't have to automate everything on day one, and I'm going to show an example of this in just a second. Uh, don't don't over-automate. Uh, phase things in. You can use workflow to gather metrics and feedback into the loop for your continuous process improvement. Don't try to do it all day one. You'll, all you'll do is waste your time. Uh, you'll end up going back and redoing a lot of work. If there's scope creep, scale back. Remember Jim's rule, if it takes too long, you're going to have, you're going to probably fail. So this is an actual uh, process, uh, workflow automation process that I did for a, uh, a very large community college system in Florida. Um, there's a lot going on before this, but this was kind of the core of what people do, and it kind of gets to the heart of, of the, uh, you know, keep it simple and, and let people do their job. <clears throat> On the left side, coming into that process document staff action box are documents. Basically, they were, uh, they, because it's a community college, a lot of the documentation for appli applicants came in over the, over the counters and in, across the multiple campuses. So they would lose track of who had what, where it was, what the status was. So. Now what they were doing is anything that came in over the counter was scanned at the counter. Anything that came in the back office was scanned at the back office. And it came into this box. And it was, there was a queue here and people were allocated work. Excuse me. So if you follow the line to the top where it says further review and then to the, um, the pink or red boxes, um, You'll see that it says manual selection from a list of available staff, and that list came from the Active Directory uh, group. So what they were doing basically is a staff member was looking at the kind of information that came in. They were saying, send it to Sally, send it to John, send it to Paul. Um, very simple. There were all kinds of rules that we tried to come up with that, to do this automatically, and in the end we said, you know what, let's just let people do their job. They know what to do, so go ahead and let them you know, just send it automatically, and or send it manually, I'm sorry. And then if, if someone downstream got the wrong packet, they were able to reassign it as well. But of course, workflow is tracking all that so we knew where it was and what was going on. That was the key to them is they want to know where stuff was, who had it, and what was its status. If you go down to the suspend box, down to that orange box, one of the options for the staff was, hey, I'm working on something, it's getting you know, I'm going to launch, I'm going to suspend it. Or I need more information, I'm going to suspend it till I get information back. And then the middle step was to create a letter. It's a, uh, it was just a, an information letter and a, a conditions of admittance. So it was a manual process. We were going to automate it going into it. We said, now we're not going to do that. We'll just leave it be a manual process. Anything that goes into that queue for create COA, someone will work that queue and just do it manually. And then the bottom box, obviously, is the finish. I did my work, and I'm done. So what we did there was just eliminate a whole bunch of attempt to do a whole lot of business rule development, and instead we, we um, just let people do their job. So it's a really good example of keeping it simple, let the data accumulate, and then go in and fix the bottlenecks and clean up some of the business rules and add them in at a later step. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. So I just want to talk about that suspend rules, because if you do get into using uh, workflow software, one of the gotchas in any design is you allow work to go somewhere where it gets hung up. It basically just gets lost in the, in the process and, and doesn't escape. It's a black hole. Um, so uh, if you look at the bottom right box that just popped up, the suspend rules, what we put in there was we pop up suspended items the next time the, the user logs in. If after X amount of time that the person who suspended it doesn't do anything, they'll get an email. And if more time than that goes by, we'll email the manager and say that an item is in suspense and requires action. <clears throat> and the reason for that is obviously people get sick, you know, they leave work, the kid gets sick, whatever, they don't come back for a few days. So. Wanted to make sure that a black hole didn't exist. So the next step then is um, continuous process improvement. So with any workflow process, uh, 
any process improvement effort, you're not going to get it all right the first time. So you have to evaluate um, what you've done and continuously improve it. Uh, if you're doing workflow automation, it's inevitably going to need tweaking. Uh, one of my clients did a, a major rollout in a year and a half. They rolled out 20 departments with um, both document management and workflow. And after that year and a half, they had to hire another business analyst because the, the earlier departments all wanted additional um, tweaking done to their workflows. And they wanted, you know, things change, business rules change. Um, you got to come back and fix things. Uh, business changes. You know, you, you drop a line, you add a line, you increase work, you buy a company, things change. So you got to, you know, go back and fix it. And as I've said repeatedly, when you're using workflow software, you're gathering metrics. You know, everything's in a database. You can identify your bottlenecks. Um, it can really be a huge help in, in guiding improvements. Um, I like to say that you don't want to pave the cow. I'm from Wisconsin, so you, you don't want to pave the cow path, um, you know, when you're doing a future state. You want to improve, improve the process, not just automate a bad process. However, there are times when you automate a relatively bad process so that you can get the metrics so that you can prove that it needs to be uh, needs to be uh, reworked. Um, so sometimes you do pave the cow path, but you know it's pretty rare. Okay, so those are the five steps. Scope, get the scope right, model the current state, get buy-in, implement the future state, and then continuous process improvement. Okay. So a few more tips for process improvement rollout. Um, and please, if you have any more questions, uh, throw them out there. I know I'm, I'm, I, I will have time here at the end, too. So I purposely planned for about 10 minutes to, to uh, talk about any uh, processes you may have that you want to talk about. Um, I've worked in government, private industry, almost any industry you can imagine uh, we have experience in. So um, I can try to address some specifics at the end here. Um, so if you've got a specific process you're thinking about designing, throw it out there and we'll, we'll talk about it. Um, so some rollout tips, uh, make sure you build the right team. Uh, you want to make sure that the folks involved are actively interested in, in improving the process and they have the knowledge to, to help make it work. Um, get input from affected staff, as I said earlier. Um, I'm, I'm really big on pushing this down to the lowest levels possible. You know, have a learning lunch and say, okay, folks, here's what we're thinking about. Or have a, you know, a design session and get them in a room and say, here's what we think we know. Here's where we think we're going. What do you think? Um, obviously, if you don't do that, they're also going to wonder whether their job's in danger and all those typical things that come from change. So it's a great opportunity to, to put those kinds of uh, questions to rest. Monitor what's working, what isn't. You know, be, you, you have to be uh, really rapid in your response, especially if you're automating workflow. You got to make sure that there's no uh, black holes that work's being stuck in, that um, business rules are working right, uh, and that kind of thing. So you want to really monitor uh, carefully what's happening and be ready to uh, move forward on, on fixing it. And then from, a, as I mentioned in the future state, I'll just touch on these again. The phased approach, be sure you implement in a reasonable amount of time. Keep the business rules simple. People know their jobs. Don't over-automate. Phase it in. And, uh, you know, if you're getting scope creep, scale it back and follow Jim's rule. Um, so that was the end of the formal slides. Um, we've got 10 minutes left, which we planned on. So... I'd like to see if uh, anybody has a specific process they're thinking about or uh, questions that came up from this presentation so far that I can address. So I'll give you a minute here to type in a, uh, a question or a thought. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, just while we give folks a, a moment to maybe ask more questions or, or share what they're working on, um, I wanted to also just mention there were a couple questions, and I, I did – mentioned this, but the session is, record, is being recorded. Uh, we'll, we'll have a, a, a link to it later as well as, uh, and we'll send you all an email about that as well as a link to the slides, as Jim mentioned. So yeah, we, we do want to know what, what you're working on, what some of the challenges are in the processes that you design, uh, maybe based on the industry, based on um, 
some of the technology based on the user op adoption, organizational issues of, of getting through that process. Uh, Jim, so here's a question. Okay, how about um, scripting type processes for use in, in contact centers? <clears throat> um, typically that would be done within the CRM. Um, if you're um, looking at you know, interaction with business systems and based on what the contact center is, um, uh, the issue that's being discussed, uh, if you want to try to go grab information from different systems to present to that contact person, um, that would be a little bit of a different nuance. Uh, I don't have a huge amount of experience with CRM you know, contact scripts and that kind of thing. I know there are lots of products out there uh, like Arborsoft that are uh, compound, uh, you know, XML management systems that do that kind of thing. Uh, that's not something we do a lot of. Uh, CRM is one area where we just, we haven't, we haven't had a lot of experience, but um, so I, I, maybe you can email me later and uh, talk a little bit more about what you're trying to accomplish, I might have some better ideas for you. I have another question. Um, I'm working on a project with our ERM platform dynamics. Whoops, that scaled away from me. Scroll back here. Uh, I'm thinking of dividing it into inputs first, data in towards GP, then outputs, grabbing information back to other forms. And the uh, Business intelligence, design and implement of scripts programs that harvest data. Um, yeah, um, I think I know what you're getting at here. Uh, that's probably a reasonable way to do it. Um, if you're, if the process you're working on is to um, automate the some of the data inputs and and then moving that data back out to the business intelligence side of it. Um, a lot of times the improvements in a process are with data, you know, multiple entry screens, multiple system entry, um, just difficult data entry. So if you are looking at data inputs from that standpoint or consolidating data for data inputs, I think that would make a lot of sense. Um, and then, uh, then once you've got the data in, phase in the, the backside. Um, you know, if you're using scripts and programs to harvest data, you know, you, you, you know, obviously I don't know exactly what the problem here is that you're trying to address, but you, you do that specifically for what your outputs are that you want. Um, if you're trying to grab data and push it to people based on on real-time state changes, then you may want to use, you know, database triggers and uh, and or workflow for that because it, you know, that's a good way to handle it because uh, a workflow can manage uh, monitor states in a database and when the state changes, do something. So it is an alternative for you. Other uh, questions or thoughts? Oh, if not, we can uh, we can start um, wrapping up here. Did we see the um, Did you see the latest chats that have come in here? Uh, <clears throat> no. Repurposing service that. modules. Oh, this is getting back to the CRM uh, CRM issue, I guess. Uh, let's see. The one with uh, the one for um, phased rollout. Uh, no, uh, up in the chat, uh, Jim. Up, uh, it's actually, I think, um, we're saying uh, repurposing service modules or developing a services, um, <laughs> developing a, a, a resource management. Uh, I'm trying to paraphrase it here. I'm, I didn't see that. It didn't come in. Oh, me. you know what? You're not seeing that. Let me let me let me just uh, bear with us, folks. I'm just going to give Jim okay. that one. It came in privately. That's why. 
Okay, uh, repurpose service module or develop a resource manager for dynamic CRM and dynamics is already handled in desire to use existing CRM licenses. Um, is this something that should be done in CRM? So that really gets back to the integration. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't. Hats. I don't have a good answer to that. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know that. It sounds like there's there's as many data integration challenges there as there are process integration. Uh, right. Yeah. That's that's true. Totally, and you know, so yeah, I don't have a good answer for that. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, um, and and uh, there's a, a word of support there um, from a fellow Trekkie. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, well, why don't we start wrapping up here? Um, Jim's uh, contact information obviously is there. I'm sure he'd love to take more of your questions uh, offline. Jim, uh, thanks so much for joining us today. Absolutely, and I appreciate uh, all of you attending. All right, and thanks everyone for all the great questions for your attention today, and uh, do be on the lookout for a follow-up email. So thanks so much and have a great day. Bye-bye.